Good afternoon, everyone. My name is John Schaefer. I'm the Associate Director for Graduate Student Success and Professional Development with the Graduate School. Welcome to our career talk today. Just a couple housekeeping items. <clears throat> First of all, um, this session is being recorded. I do ask that you keep all of your questions to the end of the program after our speaker is completed. And um, I will stop the recording at that time and then, and then we will open it up to questions for Dr. Browning. You can either um, put your questions into the chat and I will field those questions for our speaker or you can raise your hand and turn on your camera and unmute yourself and you can ask your questions verbally. So let me do a proper introduction. Uh, Dr. Joanne Browning was named Dean of the UTSA College of Engineering and Integrated Design and David and Jennifer Spencer Distinguished Chair in Engineering, in Engineering and Roland K. Bloomberg Endowed Professor in Architecture in September 2021. Previously, she was Dean and David and Jennifer Spencer Distinguished Chair of the, of the UTSA College of Engineering named in August 2014. She was named Interim Dean of the College of Architecture, Construction and Planning in August 2019. Previously, she was a faculty member at the University of Kansas for 16 years and served two years as Associate Dean of Administration. While at KU, Dr. Browning twice was awarded the Miller Award for Distinguished Professional Service in 2004 and 2011, and was the 2012 recipient of the Henry E. Gould Award for Distinguished Service to Undergraduate Education. In 2015, she was, she was named a Purdue Distinguished Woman Scholar. In 2016, Insight into Diversity Magazine presented her with the Inspiring Women in STEM Award. She received the San Antonio Business Journal Women's Leadership Award in 2018. Dr. Browning has been active in the engineering community as president of the Kansas chapter of the American Concrete Institute, Earthquake Engineering Research Institute, and the American Society of Civil Engineers. She has served on the board of directors of ACI and on the ACI 318 Building Code Committee. Her own research interests include structural engineering, earthquake engineering, engineering materials, reinforced concrete design and analysis, and engineering education. She received the American Concrete Institute's Young Member Award for Professional Achievement in 2008 and was named an ACI Fellow in 2009. Dr. Browning is a professional engineer in the states of Kansas and Texas. So I would like to welcome Dean of the College of Engineer Engineering and Integrated Design, Dr. Joanne Browning. And Dr. Browning, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you so much, John. I really appreciate that. I appreciate um, all of your help getting this together. You've been professional as always. Um, I, I wanted to start off just by saying, how grateful I am to the graduate school for putting together this, these series of speakers. Um, I know in the past that we've had people from industry and people from um, other institutions. And uh, I just am a true believer that you can learn a lot from other people's stories. And uh, you can recognize things in yourself um, that you may not have recognized before. You, when new opportunities present themselves, you may be readier to, uh, to recognize that and to jump into to that new opportunity and, and find a new um, place for yourself just by learning how other people have, have traversed through their careers. So just a big thank you to uh, Dean Mather and to you, John, of course, um, and all of the staff at the Graduate School for being so forward thinking and providing a community for our graduate students to learn from and, and be together in. Okay, so I, I do have a few slides that I thought I'd share with you today, um, but I promise, well, at least I don't think it's gonna be um, uh, too onerous on, on uh, trying to keep up with the words and everything. Uh, instead, I, I hope it'll be just illustrative of some of the, some of the things that I'm trying to talk about today. Uh, John, can you see this first slide okay? Are you seeing the presentation? Yes, you look good. Okay, good. thank you so much. So um, I was asked to talk about my uh, career trajectory, uh, and mine is one that went through engineering. Um, but it, of course, I think everything starts with where you grow up and, and the kind of people that you've been around throughout your, your path and your journey. And, and so what I hope you'll recognize throughout this talk today is that really I'm going to, to focus a lot on people. And, and I think it's, it's the people that, that you work with, that you live with, that you, um, I, 
that you socialize with, that you argue with, <laughs> that you learn from every day that, that is really the biggest difference maker in your life. And, and um, for me, what I've learned is that if I, if I have people that I really enjoy working with, then, then life is good and, and everything else works itself out. Um, and, and so, you know, I, I started here, I was born and raised here. Uh, well, not here, not on this, in this farm, but um, in Kentucky, in the bluegrass. And, and so, um, but this is um, very indicative of the, of the surroundings that I grew up in. And, and it was just a, a beautiful place to be and, and very family oriented and just a, a wonderful um, childhood experience where I, where I actually grew up. Um, this is Lexington and you can see kind of all the horse farms and so on that are out this way um, was in a, a little tiny house. And I found this picture on, on Google earth. Um, this was my little house, three bedroom, one bath. Um, me and my brother had to fight over that one quite a bit. Uh, and, um, and just a little carport here, uh, you know, combined living uh, dining area. And, but it was a great, it was a great place to grow up. Now, um, this, our house was right down the street from, um, well, the church where my, my father was a minister and where my, uh, another church where my mother was a kindergarten teacher, um, but also from the University of, of Kentucky uh, football stadium and spent a lot of time with my brother um, walking from my house to the football games and and being a part of that that culture so it, even though Lexington's not a university town there certainly it was a great uh, appreciation for the University of Kentucky and, and how much of an influence the faculty had on us daily and in fact I had an opportunity to take summer classes at the University of Kentucky and, and I was interested in archaeology at the time and uh, doing things like that and so I, I learned a lot about how how a university can really influence a town and its people. Um, in fact, you know, I, like I said, here we are down here in San Antonio, um, and I, I don't know if you can see my mouse down here, and then really where I, I grew up here in Kentucky, um, most of my family is in West Virginia, and I, honestly, we went down to Tennessee sometimes for, for vacations, but we didn't travel a lot as a family, and so I was, I was pretty insulated in, in the people I got to know and, and so on. Um, but they're great people. Uh, all of my family actually is from West Virginia. And my father's side is from Logan County, um, which is really in the mountains, um, close to the, the border with Kentucky. In fact, you may have heard of the Hatfields and McCoys. Well, the Hatfields are from Logan County. Um, and uh, most of my family on my father's side still lives there today. A few people have moved out, including my father. But um, I, a lot of people still living there. My my grandfather was a foreman in the mines um, in this coal mining territory. And one thing that he, my, as my father tells it, had asked my um, my relatives, uh, asked his his uh, sons is to promise him to not work in the coal mines because he ended up um, dying of lung cancer and uh, it, it was rough on, on them. Um, but certainly an appreciation for you know, energy sources and, and the type of skills it takes to, to be able to um, provide that type of energy to a country. Um, my, grand, my mother grew up in Winfield, West Virginia, which is along the I-64 corridor. And um, Winfield is probably best known uh, for its dam and lock system, uh, which is along the Kanawha River, which runs through Charleston, West Virginia. Um, and really changed that geography in a way that made um, barges navigable on, along that region. Uh, I had many um, relatives that worked in, in building those lock and dam system. Um, didn't really grow up appreciating the, in the civil engineering skills behind it, but knowing the importance of the lock and dams to the people. Uh, and so it wasn't so much the technical aspect, but how engineers change lives that, that I was learning about. Uh, another aspect of this, and this was just, this is probably about a half a mile down the river from where my grandmother's house was. My grandmother's house was almost underneath this bridge, um, just a little bit up this way. And, and we talked a lot about this bridge in my family. Um, of course it was right there. So we saw traffic going over it all the time, but my grandmother, when she grew up in this town, that was in this house that was built in 1865, um, she used to take a, a barge across the river to get to high school and to get to her schools. And if the water, weather was really bad, she couldn't go to school. Uh, and, and she knew the value of an education. And, and so 
when this bridge was built and it made it so that anyone could traverse that river at any time, uh, it was a huge impact on the area and commerce in the area. It's a small little town, but it changed their lives um, in, in a much better way. My, my mother was in the uh, marching band. She was a major act. She was one of the first people to, to cross the bridge. She actually led them across the bridge. They had grand opening, you know, huge deal when this bridge came, uh, um, came open. Uh, and again, appreciation for how uh, engineers can change lives. And in West Virginia, there's so many mountains and it's all mountainous, right? It's the mountain state. Uh, and there's so many gorgeous bridges. And I used to beg my father to, to drive us across extra bridges just to, to get the view and to, um, to feel the sway, right? It feels a little different when you drive on a bridge. And so w- when I was considering pathways in uh and what kind of profession I might want to do. Um, these were a lot of influences, but I hadn't really linked it to engineering or a civil engineering word. I didn't know a lot about it. And um, it was actually a friend of mine, Conley Wake, who we were in the uh, Central Kentucky Youth Orchestra together. She played the bassoon and I played the oboe and um, who told me about engineering. She was coming to Rice here in, in Texas. And um, we had always been in like the math bowl together and such. So she knew I was really good in math and she said, you know, Joanne, you should think about being an engineer. You would be a great engineer. So again, it was a person, a friend of mine who recognized something in myself and that, that, that'll, that awoke my desire to, to look at engineering and, and uh, that determined my path going forward. Um, so I, I looked at many different schools um, and, and I had some really generous offers, but I, I chose to go to the University of Kentucky. Uh, it, it's culture fit me. It's people fit me. It was like family to me. It was, I grew up in its shadow and it was an important part of my life growing up. My, all of my friends went other places. They all went out of state and no one, no one went to the University of Kentucky with me. Uh, so I had a chance to make all new friends and so on. But to me, it was more than um, just the studying, which the studying was great. I got a solid, wonderful engineering education at at the University of Kentucky. Um, And I will talk about some of the people there that have really influenced my life going forward. Uh, But I also had a chance to experience Kentucky basketball. Jamal Mashburn was the star when I was there. And I, you know, with my friends waited uh, hours, gosh, days um, for basketball tickets and uh, um, saw Shaquille O'Neal play in live. Uh, It was when he was with LSU. Truly just a, a wonderful college experience, but with a solid education with it as well. Uh, and I also, because I went to Kentucky, I had an opportunity to, to continue playing in the orchestra. And that was important to me. Music was important to me. And uh, getting to know people from different backgrounds was really important. And um, and so being a part of that community uh, was also a, a part of my growth. Uh, and helps me, I think, as a professional later to care and to, to be an advocate for other areas um, that are outside of engineering as well. Now, when I was going through my, my studies, I, I did really well and I really enjoyed structural engineering. And it's something that I, I was interested in the beginning because of all the bridges and so on. But you, you try out a lot of different things, but structural engineering is really what, where I wanted to go. Um, and this man, uh, Dr. Islam Harik, uh, was my, he taught me reinforced concrete design, but he was also just a, a kind mentor to a lot of students. And I, it was suggested I should try to go for an NSF graduate research fellow fellowship. Uh, now, this is something that our graduate school, I think, does such an amazing job working with you guys on. And we have been really successful in the last few years in uh, and helping our students get these graduate research fellowships, but they're, they're fantastic. They are, um, they provide you with funding for tuition and fees and a, a living wage so that you can study what you want to study. And you have to write a proposal to get it. And, and Dr. Harik helped me um, pick a topic that I was really interested in. And at the time, this was right after the Loma Prieta earthquake in 1989. Um, and there was a double deck bridge uh, that had collapsed. And so, um, there was a number of bridges that needed to be reevaluated, one of them in Cincinnati. And, and I wrote my graduate research fellowship um, proposal around that. And, and I got it. I, you know, I was totally flabbergasted. Never thought that I would, I would get something like this. And, um, you know, at the time, the reason why I did it is I just didn't feel like I knew enough. And I thought, you know, going to graduate school would, would give me that extra edge so that I could, I could be a competent engineer. 
And, um, but I really didn't think that I would qualify for a fellowship. So if Dr. Harik had not encouraged me and, and believed in me, um, I'm not sure I would have applied. Um, now, a great thing about these, these research fellowships is that they are not specific to an individual school. You can take them with you. And so I, I did my master's at Kentucky with Dr. Harik, and he encouraged me to look other places to round out my education with um, uh, not just everything within Kentucky. And so I, I chose to go to Purdue University. And uh, again, very scared that I would end up packing my things and going home after a semester. Not sure um, that I would be able to, to, to hold my own with, with, with students at Purdue, um, which was at the time uh, number three program in the country, number two program in the country behind Illinois. Um, and, and so, you know, taking that leap and, and someone else who had told me, no, of course you'll be, you'll be great there, you should try this. Um, it gave me the courage to try it and, and it went really well. Um, probably the best thing that ever happened to me. Uh, because while I was there, I was able to um, start working with Metasozum as a, a graduate student. Now, you may not know who Meta is, if you, um, but he has had a tremendous influence on me and, and every student I think he's been able to work with. Um, he, you can see behind him, one of the planes from 9-11, he, he led the um, commission to study on the attack on the Pentagon as a concrete structure. Um, he also led the investigation into the Oklahoma City bombing, uh, again, another concrete, concrete frame structure. Um, and so he was world renowned in concrete structures and in um, extreme loading. Uh, when I worked with him, I was working in earthquake engineering with concrete structures. Um, but you know, this is, this is the way um, you, know, you can see him, very thoughtful, very, just a great communicator. Um, and uh, this is probably the way more people remember Dr. Sozin, however, because he was also intimidating as heck. Um, and and uh, he, he could control a crowd. But one of the things that he impressed upon me early was the importance of communication. And, and I was terrified of making making presentations in front of people. And uh, and. I, I, he invited me out to his house to make a presentation in front of all the graduate students and the faculty. And uh, I was scared to death, thought I did a horrible job when I was done. Um, but it, afterwards, he, he, he was the one that said, you know, Ms. Browning, um, you, you have a real gift. You should, you should do this more often. And <laughs> from that moment on, he uh, would have me get presentations at, at seminars on a, on a whim the day before. It'd be like, well, we don't have anyone this week. So Ms. Browning, why don't you talk about what you've been working on? And um, his belief in me that I could do it and that I was good at it, I think uh, spurred me on more than anything else. Um, another thing that he really installed in me is like I told you, I hadn't really traveled a lot before I went to Purdue. Um, I'd only been on an airplane once for a spring break trip or something. Um, and, and he, early on my first year, we did an analysis of the, um, a holiday end building that was damaged during the, uh, Northridge earthquake in 1994. And there were a number of teams that were investigating this, um, this building. And it was really interesting because it had been damaged in several, uh, earthquakes over the years. And, so seeing how it had been repaired and then the new damage would happen to it and it was instrumented. So we had accelerometers and we could look at <clears throat> how the building responded uh, over time. Um, after different retrofits, we could look at the response over the height of the building. It was really interesting. But at the time in the 90s, um, we were really moving into computational uh, savviness that was unprecedented. And the types of, of tools that we had now to run these analyses were very different than we'd had in the past. And so we were trying to really dig in and find out how accurately we can model uh, buildings to earthquake simulations, uh, earthquake motion. So we had the recorded motion in the building, we had the recorded response. And there were three teams across the country that were analyzing the same building with different techniques and to see who would come closest. And um, another thing that Meta really impressed upon me was this importance of uh, keeping things sim simple. You know, so it's repeatable. Now you have to have a wealth of information underneath that to to be able to take a very difficult concept and, and hone it down into something that is simple enough that you can spread it to a, a mass of people across a number of disciplines. Um, but in practicing engineering, it's really important to have uh, simple concepts that 
uh, cannot be easily misunderstood across a number of municipalities and, and um, uh, different types of, of um, building construction mores and so on, so that, so that you would understand that the person using your technique would not misuse it. Um, and, and, and so um, our approach to this model was very simple and was uh, and something that should be very repeatable. And I, I learned a lot from that experience and from traveling and from being in front of other people. But while we were there, he took me to dinner and, and um, he asked me what I wanted to do. And I, no one had really asked me that before. And I just mentioned to him, this is again, my first year working with him. Well, maybe I might want to teach someday, but maybe it's a community college or something like that. And he didn't forget. And so when um, it came time for me to graduate and I had a job offer in Chicago and I had a couple of offers um, at universities and I, I wasn't sure, I wasn't sure that again, can I do this? Can I do the research at this level and, and get tenured? I, I was very unsure of myself. He believed in me. He said, oh, you'll make them better. That's what he said. Um, and so I, and he also said, why, I can't believe you would even consider not doing a, a job where you can influence lives yearly, daily. You can um, help people see new opportunities in front of them and you get to choose the exciting projects that you wanna work on. Um, and, and his belief in me, again, uh, really spurred me on to say, okay, I can try this. I'm going to try to uh, uh, be a professor, an assistant professor, and see if I can get tenure. Um, and so one of the first things, I have, I think, three things in here I really want to, to emphasize about my career path that, that um, I would share with you. Uh, and maybe the first one is that it's really important to separate your healthy fears from those that hold you back. It's okay to be afraid and scared. I, I think that's very healthy um, to start that way because it helps you prepare yourself. Um, it's good to be scared of a test if you haven't studied. Uh, it's, it's good to be scared of a presentation if you haven't prepared. Um, but if you have the preparation and you have the skills, then you have to face those, those fears and, and sometimes take a jump. And sometimes listening to the people around you and what they see, um, can, can really empower you to, to take that leap. So I went to the University of Kansas. That's where I chose to go. Um, and in large part because of the people, uh, I felt so at home when I went and visited there uh, and I wanted to be a part of that community. And the people were tremendous and they're still a family to me. Uh, and I was there for 16 years um, as an assistant to associate to a full professor and some of these people, I just want to mention Kim Rodas, who was the first um, full professor in the college or the School of Engineering at the University of Kansas. Um, she, uh, she was a trailblazer. She had two kids on the way to tenure and um, she helped to, to set up some of the rules that we use later to modify workload and make it possible for me to have my four kids, uh, two on the way to tenure, well, two and a half. I was really uh, going up for tenure with the third one too. Uh, and, and went on the way to being a full professor uh, that allowed me to, to feel very fulfilled as a mother and as part of a family while still making um, progress in my career. Uh, at, at KU, I had uh, multiple mentors. I had, a, um, Kim Rodas was a great female mentor to me. Francis Thomas was my teaching mentor. Um, he's the one that, that he stepped out of his role at, as an ambassador to our department in the, for the Center for Teaching Excellence and um, it allowed me to, to do that. So I learned a lot about different teaching techniques and met people from across um, the university because he cared about me, de my development as a teacher. Uh, Dave Darwin um, cared about my development as a researcher and we worked on many projects. And I learned a lot about concrete materials and durability and the importance that is to communities as well. Um, and, and of course, as I mentioned, um, I met my husband Adolfo and at Purdue and uh, uh, we were able to have all four of our kids while we were in Kansas and, uh, and, and realize that dream as well. Um, so again, very important people uh, in my life. Now, while I was at KU, I really loved working with all the different students. Um, and, but I, when you become a full professor and you work your way through, and, and um, it can happen in any industry that you're in, as you start to, to get a little bit more leadership role, um, you tend to start slowing down a little bit and looking around yourself and thinking, 
um, well, how are people doing here? And, and uh, if there's something that maybe needs to be improved, maybe it's my turn now to, to say something about it. Uh, and one of those areas that was of concern for us was our concrete testing lab. And this is not actually the KU lab, this is somewhere else. I don't have a good picture of the KU lab, but similar type of equipment um, that, that you might've found in our lab, but probably our lab was even worse off than this. Um, and it, the thing was, is we did a ton of research. We did millions of dollars of research through the concrete lab. And we had um, about, oh, usually around, well, between eight and 12 graduate students working on our teams. We had undergraduates in there. Uh, we ran classes through our concrete lab, um, two of them actually, materials and uh, concrete design. They would uh, build and test little concrete beams. So it was a very active lab, but it was um, poorly ventilated, did not have air conditioning. Um, and uh, it, it, it just, the, the equipment was very old and outdated. Um, and so when we had a chance, we were gonna, uh, we got some funding from the federal government and through some tuition revenue bonds in Kansas to build a new uh, engineering building. I thought it was my place to, to speak up about our needs. And I was able to bring the Dean through um, and show them our spaces. And I remember um, an associate dean at the time commenting, um, you know, this space just seems really well used to me. And I looked at him and I said, you know, our students deserve better. We, uh, it may be well used space, but they, they deserve um, uh, more, uh, uh, better equipment that is up to date um, and a better space to work in. And uh, it was soon after that, that, um, the Dean of Engineering began looking for a new associate dean and kind of let it be known that I might be a good candidate. Again, didn't think it was, should be for me. It was my chair at the time that said, no, Joanne, I think actually um, you would be a great candidate for this and, uh, and suggested that I apply. And, um, and so I did, and I became an associate dean at KU. But the point here is that if you really wanna make changes um, along the way, you, you have to be willing to be that change agent. And, and sometimes that is sticking your neck out a little bit and being critical of what's in place in a respectful way. Um, but that is uh, how you will be able to, I think, uh, in, enjoy your career long-term and, and feel like that you've been able to make a difference. Um, now, I worked with Stuart Bell. He was the Dean of uh, Engineering um, when I became an associate dean. About a year after that, he left to be provost at LSU and he's now the president at Alabama. Um, it was fantastic. I learned so much from him. I learned a lot about um, listening to people and, and, uh, and, and also looking for ways to incentivize the people around you to, to act in a way that you feel like is gonna move the whole college forward. Um, and so if you're gonna build a model on how to distribute GTA funding, for example, um, the parameters you put in the, that model should be the things that you value uh, and that, that the, the college or the school at the time have said that they valued. Um, and that way, the triggers for the model to increase funding places are gonna be the same triggers that, that were, were valued by the folks to begin with. Um, and I learned a lot about administration in that way. And he put me in a place where I was a social media administration and I worked in a lot of different areas like Ju Long does now in my college um, and space and policies and faculty recruitment. And with space, we were building a brand new um, facilities. Uh, and so, you know, working with faculty to design those spaces and to, to meet the needs that we had. Um, but he had a tremendous influence on, on me uh, you know, pulling me up into an associate dean position and also encouraging me uh, to think about um, what the next steps in my career could be. And in fact, before he left, he said, you know, Joanne, you should think about being an, a, a dean someday. And I never thought about it before. Um, and so when UTSA did reach out to me a couple of years later, uh, you know, it was something that was very important to us to come to a Hispanic serving institution and something that we'd always valued, my husband being from Costa Rica and and we didn't have as many opportunities to do that at KU, um, but I had more belief in myself and that I could do it because of the belief that uh, Stuart Belt show, showed in me. So my last thing I would say is to really, you know, not just this lesson of what Stuart did for me, but what you can do for others as well, 
is to never underestimate the power of believing in your colleagues and sharing that belief with them. When you see that they're doing something great, uh, if you share with them that they have a real talent there and, and this is something they can make a difference in throughout their career, um, it is likely they're going to listen to you and that could impact when they, they step up to do something later. Um, and so I think my, 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 the theme of this presentation is that people make all the difference. And you know, at first when I had worked on this presentation, I thought this is about mentorship, but there's so many more aspects to, to the people that influence you than just the mentors. There's the advocates, of course. There's the, um, it's, it's just your colleagues and your friends you learn from. It's, the, your, it's your mentees. It's, it's all the people that you work with. And I think when you respect those people and you find value uh, in what they provide to you, yes, of course, um, and the work they do and how you collaborate together, but just in interpersonal relationships, um, it makes your life so much richer and it opens up so many more opportunities for you uh, on a career path as well. So just to, to wrap it up, some of the things that we talked about today, um, you know, try to separate those healthy fears. It's good to have fears, um, but you know, recognize when they might be holding you back uh, versus when um, versus when it just means you need, may mean you need a little more preparation. Uh, if, you, if you want change, if you recognize places that need change, be willing to be that change agent. Now, sometimes you have to wait till you're ready to be that change agent. I, I couldn't have done that as an assistant professor told the dean that um, this thing's had to change. It wasn't my time yet. But by the time I became a full professor and I had earned my time through it, I was, I was ready to, to look at a broader picture and, and make a statement that could be heard. Um, and never underestimating the power that you have in believing in other people and how you set them on their paths as well. And that people make all the difference. So John, that's the end of my presentation. I hope I didn't go too long. Um, and I'd, I'd love to, to, if there's any questions that I can answer, I'd be happy to.